Hello, my name is Jesse Jones and I am the volunteer coordinator for Coast Watch. In May during the quarantine, Coast Watch went online and we recorded a number of webinars related to marine debris. And May 13th, Elizabeth Roberts joined us. She is a marine debris artist based in Bandon, Oregon. Coast Watch is a mile by mile program where volunteers adopt a mile of the Oregon coast. We ask them to walk their mile four times a year, collecting simple data, and then to upload that onto our website. We also connect volunteers with scientists from the West Coast, California, Washington, and Oregon to survey everything from sea stars, marine debris, beached birds, beached mammals, and so much more. Please be sure to check out the other videos on our YouTube channel for more education and ways that you can participate. Coast Watch is a program of Oregon Shores Conservation Coalition who has been working nearly 50 years for the protection of our coast. Please check out oregonshores.org for more information and enjoy the webinar. First jobs that I took was working for a float plane company where I got to load airplanes and unload them and fuel them. And the reason I took that job was it allowed me to jump seat uh, when I wasn't working and go on flights around the interior of the island. So I got to see a lot of the interior that I might not have otherwise um, had seen. So in 2013, when the opportunity came up to volunteer uh, to go on a marine debris cleanup expedition on the south end of Kodiak in the Trinity Islands, I was all for it. You could volunteer for a week and I chose to go for a whole five weeks and live in a tent and pick up marine debris. So to get there, we had to go by float plane. And so here's a kind of a slide of us gearing up and getting ready to go. Um, this was our pilot on the, the uh, right and on the back right was Tom Pogson, who was the marine debris coordinator for Island Trails Network, the nonprofit organization based out of Kodiak, Alaska, that was working with uh, the state as well as Gulf of Alaska Keeper to do these large scale cleanups. Um, this is leaving Kodiak and so you can kind of see why they call it Alaska's Emerald Isle. So this is Tagetic Island. It's a critical habitat area that's managed by the Alaska Department of Fish and uh, Wildlife. And what's really unique about this island is that it's, uh, it's a critical habitat for ground nesting birds and also for sea lions. And what's unique is that there are no predators on this island. So there's no foxes, there's no bears. Um, so animals can actually nest there without being predated upon. So I'm not sure if you guys can see my mouse. So where we flew in was a place called Pickup Point, which was here inside this sort of this little inlet. And we were gonna be spending the next month basically cleaning this 12 mile stretch of beach. And so there was a base camp uh, set up there for us. And this is just kind of landing at Pickup Point where the crew was waiting for volunteers to arrive. And so offloading all of our gear. And so in the grass on the beach were all of these chicks, these seagull chicks, which was really cool to be able to get up close and, and look at them. So to get to our base camp, we had to take turns riding on a four wheeler because it was a 12 mile hike. And the area that was chosen for the base camp was actually an old uh, kind of gold mining, panning clay, uh, homestead claim that was no longer being used. And so we were able to convert one of the sheds into sort of a base camp. Uh, this was our communal kitchen where we would um, filter water. We had a wood stove in the back to dry out our clothes. And this is kind of where we would prepare meals and hang out uh, in the evenings. And we also shared it with a lot of other critters as a bowl. 
Um, this was kind of our dishwashing station and also our weather port where we stored extra supplies. And so there's a lot of old buildings that were still there from the Garber family that once lived there, which was kind of neat to see this little bit of history. And so you can see we, we did live in tents and every day we would basically go out and start cleaning up everything that we could find. And we found a lot. Quite a bit. A lot of it, of course, is fishing gear, but there's a lot of industrial type stuff too. And we would remove any kind of nets and ropes. Uh, if we couldn't pull it out of the sand, we'd cut it off um, as much of it as we could remove. Um, this was hauling stuff back across. There was an old rack line on the other side of this sort of tidally influenced area. And we got a little creative with hauling the trash back using an old uh, tote lid to float it across. So this, there's this big log jam that we cleaned. I wish I would have had a before picture. Um, this was the after picture, but we actually went through this entire log jam and picked everything out of it that we could that was visible. I don't know if many of you remember the Kulik, uh oil rig when that ran aground in Alaska. Um, we found it skiff and we actually had to cut it up and with a sawzall and bag it up and remove it. And this is back at pickup point. So everything uh, that we collected, we would store in these big super sacks. And we had a little fun photo shoot that day, hauling the stuff back there. A woman's work is never done. <laughs> This was one of the largest items that we had to remove. Um, we had to get a little creative. <laughs> it took us a bit, but we were finally able to get it up on this trailer and get it hauled out of there to pick up point. What is that, Elizabeth? So that's a, that's one of, it's a big buoy. Um, I'm not sure uh, what it's used for other than maybe for big uh, industrial cargo ships, perhaps. But it's a, yeah, it's a giant rubber buoy. So often I get I get asked like what's the most unique thing that you've ever found beach combings? I've seen I've pretty much seen it all but I have to say that the most interesting thing I have found are these these drift program cards. Um, so I found three of these within about a hundred meters of each other on the same stretch of beach. There's the second one and then the third one was just this small fragment and so I sent them in to Noah and I got an email response from them that said, we have no idea what these are, we'll get back to you. And so they, they reached out to Dr. Curtis Ebbesmeyer, who is uh, an oceanographer and studies ocean currents. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever read his book, Flots and Metrics, but it's, it's a really fascinating book. And he went digging through their archives and uh, was able to get back and, say, and let me know that these cards had been dropped, like the first two had been dropped around Puget Sound um, in the 1970s. And this third one, um, this little fragment, had actually been dropped off of the coast of Nantucket Island in the Atlantic Ocean and had traveled apparently over the polar ice cap and found its way through the Bering Sea to the Gulf of Alaska and on the same island as those other two cards, which was actually pretty incredible. Oh, here's a little video I'm gonna play. I think I can play it. Um, this was put together by Tom Pogson from uh, Island Trails Network of our expedition. And if anyone has any questions to ask, feel free to use the Q&A and ask them and we will answer them. spreads 
far beyond our own backyard. Um, even in a place as remote as Tahitic Island that has very little human interaction, the impact here is huge. <laughs> was in essence meant oh, to just be we a have, we have a question oh okay let's see elizabeth you can um elizabeth who asked not you but is there a, if you could type your question into the q a that would be the best way to ask do you see the q a you can keep yeah. your you can keep your screen there okay well uh, let's see yeah, Elizabeth, the only way that I can, um, that we can communicate right now is for you to use the Q&A that is enabled um, down there. So, and if you can't figure that out, you can send me an email and I can, um, and I can ask. We can do it that way. Okay, continue on, Elizabeth. Okay, so in essence, what was going to be a fun summer adventure kind of turned out to be a rather life changing experience for me. Um, I think after the first couple of days, you know, when you picked up like 500 plastic bottles and, you know, you're noticing all of these things that you purchase and use or have at home in your cupboards. Uh, I was even finding things that I played with as a kid. And it really got me thinking, like, is any of this stuff mine? So every day sort of became this daily meditation on what a way meant. And when it came time to go back to town and back to civilization after five weeks of this, it's like I was suddenly seeing plastic for the first time. And when I went to go get groceries, it was like I was just blown away. Like I couldn't unsee it. And it really set me on a path of reducing the amount of plastic waste that I personally generated. And so every year I get a little bit better at um, 
minimizing my waste. And so it's been kind of a, a journey at um, being more uh, self-sufficient and, you know, cooking from scratch and buying in bulk and bringing my own bag. I remember, I remember how hard it was in the beginning to remember to bring my own bag. I would always forget it in my car and I would actually load everything back into the grocery cart and take it out to my car and put it in my bags rather than accept a plastic bag. And it took a couple times of doing that to not forget my bags ever again. And so it, one step at a time, um, from there it became bringing reusable mugs and now it's trying to remember when you go and eat out to not have, you know get a plastic straw on your drink so it's just one step at a time um, so after that um, that volunteer trip I actually got hired on to do another 10-day cleanup um, in the north the northern part of Kodiak here on a Fognac island and it was a, just a 10-day cleanup and it was a little bit different uh, than what we did uh, in Tagidic where we just loaded everything up in those big super sacks because there was a they were going to come clear those out a little bit later this one we actually let's see we actually um, these are the sites that we visited in those 10 days um, and we actually um, went by ship and so this was home for 10 days um, and every day we would get in a skiff and we would get dropped off somewhere along the coast we had two teams of six, so we'd get dropped off in different locations and we would scour the area and collect all of the beat, the trash off the beaches. And, and we'd kind of load it up and the skip would come pick us, pick us up. Oh, and if we weren't done cleaning, they would just haul out some of the trash back to the ship um, and put it in the, in the hold of the ship to be uh, carried back to town. So when we loaded up the ship, um, we would go back to town. So I think we made a couple of trips back and forth because it didn't take long to fill it up, surprisingly. Um, we found quite a few notes and bottles during some of these cleanups, mm -hmm. which was always kind of fun. Um, we came across this salmon staining net, which was all tangled up uh, on these trees. And with a lot of sweat equity and a chainsaw, we were able to get it removed and get it on board, which was really satisfying. Um, this was the end of that particular 10 day uh, expedition. Um, so the following year, um, we went back to some of these places, but um, before we went, actually went back to uh, a fog neck and Shuiak Island. But before that, um, this is kind of a little bit of a time lapse because we did another expedition before that, but I'm gonna, I kind of lumped these all together. So this is Shuiak Island, which is a really beautiful island. It's, a, I believe, uh, it's owned by uh, state parks. There is actually a cabin there that you can rent. It's really hard to get to, <laughs> but it's absolutely stunning. It was probably my favorite island in the Kodiak Archipelago that um, I had a chance to visit. So a lot of times when you have uh, big storms and uh, high, you know, high weather, weather events, things get washed up beyond the beach and into the forest. So here's a little before picture and a little after picture which was always really satisfying to leave an area cleaner than you found it. We always felt really good about that. Um, however, there was one particular beach um, that I'm gonna show you here in a minute. I had to add this little picture. Most people might not know what this is, but these are actually bear tracks that are worn in the moss. So this is a, a trail that bears travel, have been traveling for so long throughout, you know, that they've worn their footprints into the moss. And we actually did encounter a bear on this trail, which was really cool. He actually uh, went around us. So this is one of the dirtiest beaches that we found. Um, and sadly, it was the last day that we had on this expedition and we found it rather late in the day. Um, so we weren't actually able to finish cleaning it, which was a really hard way to end that trip. And that, you can't really tell in these pictures, but that styrofoam, was all throughout that those logs and it was literally like a like one of those ball pits that as a kid you can jump into like you could try to dig down to the bottom of it but you wouldn't find the bottom it was really deep so it was it was rather heartbreaking actually 
-hmm. I believe they did go back the following year and, and clean that up. So here's us in town uh, getting ready to offload. Uh, all those smaller bags, those green bags and some of the yellow bags, uh, we'd pull those out of the fish hold and then we would load them up into these super sacks and then offload them and weigh them and calculate the weight and then put them on a truck where they were stored in a storage yard until we could figure out what to do with them because we didn't really want to put them in the landfill because Kodiak has such a small landfill that's reaching capacity already. Mm -hmm. So we were trying to figure out what else to do with it. So this expedition was really cool. This was on Kayak Island um, near Cordova. And I believe this was about a 28 day expedition. This was also on the Island Sea. And again, this was a, a different as well because this time we weren't actually bringing the trash back to the boat. And the reason being that there was no real way to get to shore because it was so shallow. There was only really one spot where you could get to shore. Um, and we used that particular landing point to get two uh, ATVs and trailers on the beach. And then um, we would, uh, we had to get those trailers around. Let me go back to my slide on Tagetic. So where we landed was over here. And so we had to get those four wheelers over here because we were gonna be working this side of the island. And so it was kind of tricky because there was a lot of boulders and things through here to try to do that, um, but we managed to do it. And then the boat was anchored offshore uh, out a ways from the island and we would take a skiff um, and then get into a Zodiac because the skiff couldn't get close enough. And then we get dropped off at low tide on these tidal flats and then have to hike to our four wheelers. And so it was six people per four wheeler. <laughs> and so some folks would have to ride in the trailer while four other people were on the bikes. And of course, the longer we were out there, the further we would have to travel every day to get to the places that we left off and we had creek crossings and all kinds of fun stuff but there was a lot of bigger um, industrial debris on this island uh, lots of log jams which and we worked in all kinds of weather if it was safe enough to get to shore we worked if it was raining or not so you'd have some long days generally we'd work about 10 hour days uh, we had radio checks and with the with the boat, they would check up on us. And uh, we had bear spray and air horns in case we had bear encounters, which thankfully we did not. Um, there's a whale skull that we found, which was really cool. I don't know what kind of whale it is, but it's, it was a big one. And this kind of gives you an idea of some of the landscape. It's really beautiful. So we would find a lot of uh, fishing buoys, fishing floats. And what we would end up doing is stringing them on rope that we would find so that they didn't take up, uh, you know, valuable space in those large super sacks. And so those super sacks, we would actually fill, fill them up and tie them together and take uh, coordinates so they would be geocached since they couldn't get a landing craft to shore. Um, these were going to be airlifted out at a later date. Um, we found some interesting things. Here's a life ring from a boat registered in Panama, a Japanese buoy. Um, and this is, you can see the boat anchored offshore here. This is actually across from the island on the mainland. This was our, our last uh, couple days there. So we were over on Oakley Spit. And it was really cool because that morning before we headed out, you could hear wolves howling. And that was the first time I'd ever heard wolves. And uh, they had left their tracks on the beach. So there's my hand, which is crazy. They're huge, big paw prints. And so this was our last day um, out there on this expedition, which was pretty fun. It was a lot of fun. So this, here's a, this is two barges that were welded together. This is all of the marine debris that was collected uh, between the, the expeditions that we had done, as well as some other expeditions throughout the state with Gulf of Alaska Keeper. Um, and this barge um, came down past British Columbia and picked up some stuff that they had cleaned up there and docked in Seattle. And the intentions were 
that this was all going to be sorted um, and what could be recycled or upcycled was going to be used. But unfortunately, the city of Seattle uh, deemed it hazardous waste and wouldn't issue permits for us to sort it. Um, and it all ended up uh, in a landfill in uh, Oregon, in Eastern Oregon, which was really depressing. <laughs> so. Oh, we have a question, it looks like. Yeah. Oh, let's see, go to Q&A. Oh, oh, actually, um, yes, we can. Oh, I want to, I, okay, he wants to identify the whale? <laughs> cool, I'd yeah. love to know what kind it is. Yeah, you could send Joy Primrose that photo and she could help you with that. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Elizabeth. <laughs> okay. Okay, that's quite a sight, that barge, wow. That is yeah, and these are those big 40 foot like containers that you see on a semi truck. And then there's like this little one sandwiched in between it. So it gives you an idea how big it is. It's a lot, <laughs> it's a lot of garbage. So this, this brings me back to Oregon. Um, I moved back down to Oregon uh, at the end of 2014 after that expedition and realized that Oregon has a lot of garbage on its beaches as well. And so I ended up doing a lot of cleanups uh, in more remote areas because I've noticed like Oregonians love their beaches and people are really great about doing uh, cleanups. And, but I noticed that some of the harder to reach areas like in the plover uh, habitat restoration areas um, those places were sort of going, you know, unnoticed. They weren't being cleaned. So I'd spent a lot of time um, out in those areas doing cleanups. Um, this is out on um, 10 mile north. Um, and here's just kind of a random selection of things that um, I would save for making art. Gives you an idea of some of the fun things that I found here in Oregon. Lots of colorful things. Um, this is uh, Angela Hazeltine Potsy from Wash Ashore. I started volunteering with them in 2015. And uh, I got to help build some of their sculptures. So this is one that I've worked on while I was with them volunteering. This Mako shark. And did a little bit of refurbishing of this one. And then that summer in 2015, I was chosen to participate in an expedition with the Rosalia Project in partnership with Parlay for the Oceans um, in the Gulf of Maine. And I was excited because they were looking for all kinds of people and one of their, they were looking for an artist and I was like, oh cool, I'm gonna apply for that. And it was kind of funny because I, I didn't get chosen because I was an artist. <laughs> but I actually got chosen because I'd been on um, those other cleanups in Alaska. And I was really curious to see what the differences were in what was washing up on the beaches uh, in the Atlantic as opposed to the Pacific. And it was a very different experience um, than what I had participated in in Alaska, where we were just going for volume and trying to get as much trash off the beaches as we could. This was more science-based, and so we had set parameters. This is uh, Rachel Zoe Miller. She is the founder of the Rosalia Project and captain and owner of the American Promise, which is a really cool boat, it has a really neat history. Um, a man by the name of Dodge Morgan owned this boat, and he was the first person to solo circumnavigate the globe in this boat, which was really neat. And so our first day out, we actually encountered balloons. <laughs> And they, I, we actually, I believe, uh, contacted the mayor <laughs> whose balloons these were <laughs> from his campaign. Mm -hmm. So we visited a lot of uh, islands in the uh, Gulf of Maine. We went to a lot of remote locations. The first island uh, that we went to was Hurricane Island. This was sort of our base of operations. Um, this is where we stored the stuff that we were collecting. Um, everything that could be recycled was recycled, was sorted and recycled, and anything that couldn't be went waste to energy. So nothing went to a landfill with this expedition. Lots of lobster buoys. I would get like freaked out when it was my turn to like do like a wheel watch or be on the wheel because there's so many buoys out there. I was so scared I was going to run over the, <laughs> the boat and get them wrapped around the, the, the propeller. So this is a uh, Hurricane Island. 
and it's the Center for Science and Leadership. And while we were there, there were students uh, there that were building their own uh, remote operated underwater vehicles. And so we gave a presentation on uh, our organization, the Rosetta Project and what we were doing. And so they got to share their ROVs with us that they were making. It was really cool. And we got to invite them on board and show them how our ROV operated. And so we actually put it in the water and sent it down. And then uh, we're able to bring something back up with the little claw that was on it, which was pretty fun. So we went to quite a few different islands and basically we had a hundred meter uh, data set that we would use to pick up trash. And for me, that was really frustrating because when you got to the end of that data set, it didn't matter what was on the beach outside of that line, you didn't pick it up. You left it there. That was hard for me. But the purpose in that was that we would sort everything we picked up in that hundred meters. So once it went in the bag, we'd dump it out and we'd go through it and catalog every single thing that was in those bags. Uh, we went to Great Got Island Preserve um, where we cleaned up a dock that had basically broken up. So there was a lot of blue styrofoam there and hauled it all back to the boat and everything went back to Hurricane Island. I think this is French Borough that we cleaned up. Yeah, that was probably the biggest haul of junk that we had to sort in the rain. It rained that day. That was kind of a miserable day. <laughs> but a lot of data was collected. And it was all put back on the boat and back to Hurricane Island. And the coolest place out of all the islands that we visited was Ilaho and Acadia National Park. And so we actually spent some time in the park uh, doing a uh, cleanup there. And it was fun because some visitors actually stopped and helped us um, collect trash for our data set. And of course we had to haul it all out because there was no road to drive it back to the harbor where the boat was anchored up. So we packed it out to the trailheads and then uh, the park staff helped us get it the rest of the way to the boat harbor. And just, yeah, beautiful. So all of that trash, oh yeah, we found a freezer on the way back, floating in the ocean. I have no idea how it got there, but we were able to get it on board. <laughs> and so once uh, we were kind of towards the end of the expedition, um, our last data set that we didn't have time to sort it on site, so we actually took it back to, uh, I think it was Bar Harbor, and kind of dumped everything out there in the harbor. and. It was great in essence because people were really curious about what we were doing. And so they would come and, and watch and ask and it really gave us an opportunity to educate the public about plastic pollution. And I think this had a really big impact um, on people because I don't think at that time a lot of people were really aware of the issue. So this was a really good learning uh, tool. And this was all of the debris that we collected in the space of a few weeks um, visiting those islands. And what was great um, about this particular expedition, each island community that we visited, we would actually take the data that we collected that day and plug it into the PowerPoint presentation. And then we'd give a presentation that evening to that community with information that was relevant to them. So I felt that that was really impactful um, so after that expedition, I got hired on with Wash Ashore um, and got to help build some sculptures. And I, one of my first projects as an artist working for them was to refurbish Priscilla the Parrotfish, which was a lot of fun. I really had a great time working on this sculpture. And we were getting her ready for our exhibit at the Smithsonian National Zoo in 2016, which was really exciting. This was my first time visiting Washington, D.C. And there she is on opening day. And it was really fun to sit on the sidelines and listen to people's reactions to the artwork. Because at first they would be like, wow, this is so cool. And they'd look at the artwork and realize that it all came from the ocean. And just to hear uh, you know, their expressions of that was, it was really fascinating. Elizabeth, was, can I ask a question about the sure. washed ashore sculptures? Um, 
I understand that this, all of this trash comes from the South Oregon coast, is that Yeah, right? it's most of them in mid coast as well. They, I know they go get, have gotten debris up at Newport as well in those areas. Okay. But it Park. all comes from Oregon. It's all Oregon trash, yes. Okay. Yeah, so these, see, these are some of the sculptures that were on exhibit um, at the National Zoo. It was really exciting. And this is myself and Angela, who is the founder and director and uh, lead artist at the Wash Ashore Project. And we were using all this styrofoam to build a bleached coral reef. And we actually built it in the building where they do their coral studies. So you could, it was really kind of neat because we're looking at real coral in tanks, like right across from where we're building this thing. Um, this was a sculpture that I got to work on uh, that was sponsored by Norwex a company that does uh, a lot of like uh, non-toxic all natural type of cleaning household products um, we got to do an installation for the our oceans conference back in washington dc at the state department so that was really cool um, here's some of the pieces that we installed for the conference this was a whale bone sculpture and there's Priscilla. And it was really cool because I was flipping through Instagram photos and I came across that and I was like, yes. I thought that was really cool to, <laughs> to see Leo taking a selfie in front of Priscilla. So this is some of the piecework um, that volunteers can do at Wash the Shore in their workshop here in Vanden. And this is like building, building a sculpture. You have a framework and we uh, kind of put a plastic skin on it and you can kind of see um, what I'm getting an idea of what I'm building here, working on some paws. So this was for a polar bear sculpture that we built, which was really fun. It was pretty big too. It's one of the larger ones I've helped build. Wow. And this is at the gallery um, here in Bandon, the Wash Ashore Gallery. And there's a weedy sea dragon um, that I, I helped build a base for that. And this was something that Angela built in memory of someone that uh, really inspired her, who I think was really into sea dragons. And then it was a great white shark. And this is one of the last sculptures I worked on for them. Um, and after that, I got invited back to Kodiak uh, to do an artist in residency. Uh, in the school district there. I'd done a lot of artist in schools work um, while I was living there. So it was really great to be invited back by the Kodiak Arts Council and the Kodiak Island Borough School District uh, to work with students um, using marine debris. And we had talked about building a mural and you know, I was like, okay, we need little, little pieces, small pieces of plastic. Unfortunately, uh, in April, things are still kind of frozen there. And so they had a hard time digging through all of the marine debris bags out in the storage yard. <laughs> so things were frozen. So when I got there, this is what they had for me. <laughs> so if you've ever seen that show Chopped, where they have the chefs, they get the mystery ingredients and they have to make something really cool out of it. I felt like a chef on Chopped. So, um, yeah, so <laughs> luckily I was able to work in the maintenance building and break some of those things down into much smaller pieces, but um, I wasn't able to build a mural with the students. We kind of had to scramble and come up with another plan, but um, she was kind of disappointed, the principal, because they really wanted a mural, so I ended up building one for them anyways. But it was really cool. We took over the library and the kids got to use power tools, which they were pretty excited about. So we did a lot of drilling. Uh, a friend of mine welded some framework for some uh, jellyfish sculptures that we were gonna work on. And so kids would come in and string uh, some of the plastic pieces. They would color sort. Uh, some of the older kids would wire bottle bottoms together. Um, and co collaboratively, we made these several jellyfish sculptures um, that were going to be on permanent display in the school library. So that was really fun. Wow. And here's like one of the last classes that I worked on with. And that was like the mural that I kind of put together for him before I left, which is on permanent display in the school. And then while I was there, I did a three day teacher training workshop and I taught, uh, worked with educators and kind of taught them some of my 
techniques and different ways of looking at marine debris as an art medium and giving them different ideas on how they can incorporate that into their curriculum. So here's some of their finished projects. So I got invited to Norway. I have a friend that lives there and she's part of an artist collaborative and she had reached out to me because um, they had a really rare uh, cuvier beaked whale that swam into one of their harbors and folks tried to get it, turn it around and get it to swim back out, but it kept coming in and it was really sick. And so as a last resort, they ended up euthanizing the whale. And when they did the necropsy, they discovered that its stomach was full of plastic and it sparked a national conversation about plastic pollution. And so she wanted to um, work with me and build a sculpture that um, they could have travel throughout Norway. And so this is my friend Jana um, on the left and, and Martha who was going to be welding the framework. Um, and this is the gentleman here, I cannot remember his name. I'm sorry, um, but he uh, let us use his building and it's a beautiful space to work in. As you can see, it had a lot of light, but it's actually kind of a museum of sorts because they refurbish antique boat engines. Um, so we had access to a lot of tools and things. And so they had done some beach cleanups prior to me arriving and we kind of sorted and washed things. And there is Martha working on the framework. And so we decided to build a Norwegian wrasse, which is a cleaner fish. Um, so they're the types of fish that will eat uh, parasites off of other fish. And I didn't know it at the time that when we chose this fish, that they're actually becoming quite rare outside of marine protected areas because fishermen are live harvesting them and selling them to uh, salmon farms to eat the sea lice off the salmon. And I find that kind of concerning because they play such a vital role in the ecosystem. And so there's less of them available because of, I think, overfishing them for the commercial salmon market. So here we are working on fins and starting to put the first layers on. And you can kind of see it coming together. This was a really fun project. Here it is finished. Um, so I spent about a month over there, um, which was great. I got to visit my friend Yana and actually see her house and where she lives. Cause we actually met here in the States um, doing artist workshops up in Washington over the years. So this is a quick little video. Um, of them uh, unveiling it at their culture house and they had all the school kids there to see it. And so we got to screen um, the film A Plastic Ocean while I was there, which was really great. Oops. And this is uh, in the city of Bergen uh, at one of the museums there. So it's kind of traveling around the country right, um, and being exhibited in different locations. Uh, this is back in Coos Bay on the North Spit and I found this old chair. I sat on one of these chairs in grade school, <laughs> so I recognized it right away. <laughs> and I thought, man, this, this could become something really cool. And it did. Uh, I partnered up with a, a friend of mine, Ron Popish, who lives up near Newport. Uh, if you've been to any of the wildlife refuges here on the coast, you may have seen his artwork on the interpretive panels. I had stopped by his house one day and noticed he had this wooden cutout of a fish in his garage in a very sad pile of garbage on his garage floor and I was like hey Ron what are you what are you doing with that and he's like oh I gotta build this this fish and I was like oh well let me know if you want some help and he was like yes please 
So um, he brought it to my studio and we together um, built this uh, striped bass for the Nori Point Environmental Center in Statsburg, New York. So they're the sort of equivalent of our South Slough. They're the Hudson R uh, River uh, Estuarine Research Center. So this was really fun. We had a great time working together. I hope I can collaborate again with him in the future because we had some, a lot of fun goofing off. <laughs> So this is, I'm going to share some of my process. So you can see um, these things, these items here, those are actually the, the brim of baseball caps. So the, the, I find a lot of these surprisingly, and I think most of them come from container spills. Um, these were some rice paddles, probably from the 2011 tsunami out of Japan. I have parts of shoes that I'm working with. Uh, there's a bottom of, uh, I think, a bleach bottle. Um, pieces of foam that are kind of soft and flexible and I'm building the lower jaw of the fish so you can kind of see the bottom of the jaw and then you can see it kind of coming together the top of the jaw and I've got pieces of hard hat um, gosh there's so much stuff in here some of it's just unrecognizable I don't know what it came from buckets or totes but here's the, the finished sculpture and it's uh, on display at the Nori Point Environmental Center. Originally, they had uh, asked Rom if, if he could do an interpretive panel, and he recommended building an actual sculptural piece for education. So we tried to include all the different bits and pieces. This is a, a commission piece that I made for the owners of Seven Devils Brewing here in Coos Bay. Um, Annie Pollard, uh, one of the owners, she actually studied Adelie penguins in Antarctica. So when her husband wanted to commission me to make her something, I was like, I know what to make. And so I built this uh, penguin sculpture for her. So that's Annie right there. And that was a lot of fun to build. So this, um, this is a couple years ago, I had an opportunity to travel to Hawaii. Um, and I had an uh, opportunity to stay with another marine debris artist who um, took me down to the south end of the big island and to a place called Camillo Beach. And here's just a little bit of footage. I, I've seen a lot of dirty beaches in Alaska, but this, this really took the cake and it was really overwhelming. Um, it was surreal. This went on for miles. As far as I could walk, this is what the beaches looked like on the south end of Hawaii. It was really depressing. You think of Hawaii, you think of, you know, paradise, pristine beaches, but that wasn't the case. So yeah, it all looked like this, all up in the bushes and the trees, all the way out on the rocks. That was crazy. So we did, we cleaned up this little cove here. We had a couple pickup trucks and it didn't really make that much of a dent, <laughs> but you do what you can. Um, Don Elwing is the artist that lives out there and he goes out there a lot and loads up his truck and does some cleanups. It's just, I just don't have words for it, to be honest. Um, while we were out there, we actually met some students uh, from the University of Hilo. Uh, they were part of the American Cetacean Society, and they were out collecting microplastics. And they actually had to hike out there because their little car couldn't drive over all the really rutted, rocky roads to get out there. So we actually uh, hauled back their plastics for them um, and gave them some more bags so that they could collect more for their research, which was really fun. To help them out. This is on Oahu. This is up by the uh, wildlife refuge where the albatross nest. So, uh, so back, uh, oops, I was back in Alaska. I got to go up to Petersburg, Alaska and work in the community there and spent a couple weeks uh, in the schools working with students. And P Petersburg's a little bit more sheltered um, so they don't get a lot of marine debris in their, their community. It's a little further out. Um, so I ended up um, mailing a lot of stuff up there to do the work that we wanted to do. And we actually um, had a public art show in the library, an installation, and invited the community out 
um, to come and see the work that I had spent doing with the students and also to un unveil a mural um, that I had made for the school. And so, click on that. So this is the Petersburg Public Library. And we did an installation called Waste Stream. And I worked with every single student in the school all the way from kindergarten to fifth grade. And they all kind of, uh, made either water bottle fish or jellyfish or just um, little dangly trash pieces. And we strung a net up um, in, on the ceiling of the library and installed this piece. And then some of the fourth and fifth graders also made um, fish out of plastic bottles um, that they collected from home, which was really fun. And they left this up, I believe, for the summer so that as visitors came to visit, they got to see it. We did a little um, sort of a museum of trash. So they realized I have one of everything in every single color. So we have combs and pens and straws and shovels, cups and spoons and toothbrushes, flip flops and paintbrush handles. Um, this was the mural that I made for them. And it was a lot of fun to build. I don't know if you can see the little halibut hidden in there. <laughs> so I've got a salmon, I've got herring, cod, and a rockfish, and a halibut. I tried to use uh, the fish that they would typically um, harvest in their, you know, their commercial fisheries in their community. So that was, it was a neat piece. And so the kids were pretty excited because they'd kind of seen me building it while I was at the school, but they didn't quite know what I was building until I unveiled it. And so they were pretty, pretty stoked. And it was fun to listen to their their reactions to things and listening to them discuss. And they were pretty well educated. Um, working with them, you know, their teachers had spent a lot of time talking about the issue of plastic pollution with them uh, prior to my arrival. So I got to have some really great in-depth conversations with them and they are on it. And I found that most students um, that I have talked to, I've visited a few schools here on the Oregon coast and they know what's up. They really um, realize the importance, you know, of the issue. So, so yeah, that's the end of my presentation. Um, you can find me on Facebook. I have a page called Make Art Not Trash, uh, or on Instagram uh, at Marine Debris Nine One One. And uh, thanks for joining us this evening. It was really fun to share uh, my passion with all of you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. This was fascinating. Um, I'm a little speechless. <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions for Elizabeth? Please feel free to ask them. Can you see that Q&A as well? Oh, yeah, I, can. I just pulled it up. It says, how can we join one of the Alaska cleanups? If you go, um, like Google search Island Trails Network, um, I can, I, I'll type that answer in there. Um, they have um, volunteer opportunities sometimes where um, you can go up there like um, and spend some time on those cleanups. Oh, is that a send? Did it send? Oh, there we go. Oh. Did you get it? Yeah, there it is. Island Trails Network. Okay. Yeah, Island Trails Network. Okay. Yeah, you can find them online. They're on Facebook. They're on Instagram. They have a website. They're a really great organization. I love what they do. Um, yeah. Check in with them. I know they did a really neat kind of uh, destination, like vacation type of thing where uh, you got to go out and uh, sea kayaks and do cleanups up on Shuiak and, and base camp up there. It was pretty cool. I didn't get to do it, but um, other people did and it looked really neat. So yeah, kind of follow them, maybe get on their email list uh, and get updates when they might be looking for volunteers uh, to do those cleanups. Well, if there's any more questions. Um, Jill asks, oops, Jill asks if, um, can we volunteer with Rosalia as well? Oh, Rosalia Project? Um, yeah, they have a website and they often put out calls for uh, folks to join their crew um, when they do expeditions. So let me type, 
I'm going to write this under the island trails. Oops. And if anyone else has questions, um, you can type, but I've also figured out how to actually, um, I can allow you to talk now. <laughs> so if you want to raise your hand, you can ask Elizabeth a question. Um, and um, I think that, yeah, I can definitely let you talk. And um, while people are thinking about theirs, I have a question um, for you. Elizabeth, did you see a difference in the debris that you saw around the globe? Did you see certain debris in certain places more than others? It seems like uh, there was fishing gear, uh, derelict fishing gear looked like uh, most yeah. of what you found. Yeah, that's relevant everywhere I went. It just varied depending on the kinds of fisheries where I was located. Mm -hmm. So on the East Coast, you know, they have similar buoys for their lobster pots that we have for our crab pots. But I found we would find, you know, lobster pot tags and a lot of rubber bands that they would put on the claws of the lobsters, lots of those. Mm -hmm. um, a lot more um, sort of, uh, I want to say like, trash trash like solo cups and wrappers and things like that on the east coast whereas i found with the west coast because of the tsunami debris you find a lot more household items like toothbrushes and combs and you know product bottles and different things like that in addition to the fishing gear so you find a found a lot more stuff here on the west coast um than on the east coast but i follow a lot of other um uh, marine debris you know, groups around other countries. And I know uh, like the coast of Cornwall in England, they get a lot of kind of similar things like that we kind of find here, um, like toys and, and just a lot of interesting things. Um, but there are some differences, definitely. Yeah. I'd say the Pacific definitely kind of took the cake for, for what, you know, I was finding a lot of, a lot of bigger stuff. And again, I think a lot of it has to do with the, the 2011 tsunami. And some of that stuff is still washing up. The last couple um, years though, um, I've noticed, and it might just, and I know a lot of it has to do with uh, wind and currents, that we haven't had a lot of new stuff washing in. A lot of the things that I have been finding um, are things that have basically being uncovered due to erosion, you know, stuff that's been buried in the, in the mm -hmm. sand or under the log jam. So you get a high water event that would lift the logs or erode the, the dunes right. and expose stuff that had been in, in there for a long time. So not a whole lot of new stuff here on the South Coast washing in the last couple. So okay. A lot. We have a we have a couple of questions. I'm gonna Stacy asks. Well, she says we have been collecting and sorting marine debris at our park for a while, but haven't found a good way to use it yet. Do you have recommendations for the general public to interact with marine debris and maybe help build something? Um, if she wants to um, email me, um, it's marine debris nine one one at gmail dot com. I would be more than happy to talk with her more about that and talk about ideas and potentially, I'm not sure where she's located, but um, you know, if all this COVID-19 thing finally allows us to, you know, not be socially distant, um, I'd be more than happy to, to work with her on a project. Um, thank you for your question, Stacy. Um, Dennis, Dennis asks, uh, he said he came in late, but uh, did you say you have worked with Wash to Shore? And yes, Dennis, she absolutely has. She volunteered with Wash to Shore and then she worked with Wash to Shore. And this webinar is recorded. So um, you can uh, look at it at, at, at a later date and, and see that. But yeah, she worked on a number of uh, sculptures with them and also traveled to Washington, DC. Um, Jill asks, did you use marine debris for creating art before you went to Alaska? Oh, I was living in Alaska at the time. And when I did, you know, started doing these large scale cleanups, I was very inspired by what I was finding. And I was collecting debris to make art with. Um, and then actually uh, took a lot of that stuff with me when I moved back down to Oregon. Um, and so just, ended up um, 
making stuff and then uh, volunteering uh, my skills with Wash Ashore after that. So, yeah. Okay. Um, John says he's blown away by your presentation, but just a couple of questions. Did all those big plastic bags from Alaska end up in Oregon landfills or alternately what became of them and other debris? And the second part of his question is your artwork is so amazing. Are the colors natural marine debris or also painted? The colors are natural marine debris. Uh, plastic comes in every single color. So, and there's no shortage of it, it seems like on the beaches. Um, all of that trash that was collected, yes, did end up in a landfill in Oregon, which was very disappointing because we really wow. had hoped. Uh, there was uh, a big effort with Parlay for the Oceans, uh, an organization uh, that partners with a lot of uh, businesses. They're the ones that partnered with, I believe, Adidas to make those uh, uh, ocean uh, shoes. I don't know if you guys saw that in the, in the news. Um, they were actually going to help divert a lot of the material uh, into, you know, uh, resources for making other products and things. And it was going to, a lot of it was going to be recycled, but because, you know, plastic, when it is in an aquatic environment, it attracts a lot of inorganic pollutants like pesticides, herbicides, pharmaceuticals that people flush down the toilet, a lot of toxic stuff sticks to plastic. And so it was deemed hazardous waste and the city of Seattle would not allow it to be um, sorted, like dumped out and sorted. So it mm -hmm. ended up in a landfill. Mm -hmm. It's kind of disappointing. Thanks for your question, John. That was great. Um, Anna asks, did you find a lot of shotgun wads on your cleanups? And <laughs> you're aware of Surfrider's initiative to track them globally? Yes, and I have contributed uh, to that on the real app. So I, I have found them pretty much on every single beach cleanup I've ever done. If it's not a wadding, it's a shell, for sure. They're everywhere. I would love to see uh, something done nationally about that. And if, you know, we can somehow, you know, use some other material that might biodegrade and not persist in the environment. Mm -hmm. And I do try to go out to some of the duck blinds that are in the estuaries and clean up after, you know, duck season because they do leave their piles of stuff there. I don't know if how you could do some kind of collection program with, you know, unfortunately not everybody is gonna use it or respect it and probably blast holes in it or put garbage in it, but it would be really great to have some kind of collection point for shells. I just can't fathom, you packed it in there when it was heavy and you can't pack it out when it's lighter and empty, it just, because the shells you can recover, it's the waddings that you really can't. Right, right. Um, Jill asks, how do you clean or what do you clean the plastics with before you use it for your art? So there's a couple different ways that you can clean it. A lot of the really small things you can put in a bucket um, and soak it with vinegar and water and let it soak for a few days and then you know, rinse it out and then soak it again um, with like peppermint oil to get rid of the vinegar smell. Um, I know that's what Wash Ashore does. Um, what I end up doing is kind of hosing things, rinsing things off really good and trying to get all the sand and stuff off of it. And then I will, if it's really gross, I usually don't use it, but um, otherwise I will just hot soapy water and, and scrubbing it. And I'll use a lot of times I find toothbrushes and things, you know, on the beach and I end up using those to clean some of the smaller items. But yeah, I usually just hot soapy water and scrubbing them. But if you need to do like a lot of bulk things, small things, it's easier just to soak them in vinegar. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question. Uh, so um, it looks like some of these, you mentioned that you were involved in some data collection as well. Was, yeah. uh, was that for NOAA? Um, that was um, with the Rosalia project in partnership with Parlay for the Oceans. Okay. Um, I'm going to assume that NOAA had access to that data. Okay. So, yeah. Last I, week- You visit we, their website, uh, rosaliaproject.com. Cool. Or, um, that you can uh, find out more information about how they use that data. Okay, that's really cool. Last week we talked to Andrew Mason from NOAA about standing stock surveys and um, 
that was pretty interesting. And it used to be that during their standing stock surveys, they would leave trash um, after they photographed it and documented it, but now they're actually picking up trash. And I'm curious if, because I there was one slide and I, I was emailing somebody a link while you were showing it, so I missed it, but I thought you said that you had to leave some things behind, not so, because you couldn't pick them up because you didn't have time or space, but- No, we, 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 we didn't pick them up because they weren't within our data set, because it was, um, it was more scientific. Right. We had a, a data set. We could only pick up within that area, that marked off area. Right. Um, so anything outside of that data set didn't get picked up. And that's hard. <laughs> it was really hard. Because sometimes what people do with those is they will pick it up, but they won't include it in the data set. They'll, they'll yeah, we doing that because one, we had limited space on this exactly. boat with a bunch of people and two Newfoundland dogs that were on board with us. Right. So you yeah. didn't have the space. We didn't have the space really to take anything outside of uh, what we were going to, you know, count and document. So. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, let's see if we have any more questions. I don't think we do. Did you have anything else you wanted to share, Elizabeth? I think that's that's pretty much it that I can think of right now. Okay. Yeah. Let's stop here and let you get to Yeah, it. let me do that last slide. Mm -hmm. There we are. And I was just going to um, thank Elizabeth for coming. I've just, um, and it's really nice to see you. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's really great to see you. I was really um, sad to get to go do that beach cleanup together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we got to get down there. Um, and so you are inspiring. And I think that um, having, using marine debris as a vehicle for education and inspiration about getting out there is, a, is so important. And so I'm just, I, I'm, I'm thrilled by marine debris art. And I, I think it's, I just think it's a really, really great tool. And it also teaches people the vastness of what is out there, which your slides showed that and your process shows that as well. And the sculptures show that as well. Sometimes people just have no idea what's floating out there in the ocean. So thank you very, very much. I'm going to try to share um, my screen just to give my information. Um, to everyone here. Um, and I wanted to say just a couple of, of things. First of all, thank you everybody for coming to these webinars um, that we've been having every week, week. May, we're really focusing this month on marine debris. Um, last week, we talked with uh, Andrew Mason from NOAA, and he talked about these marine debris accumulation and standing stock surveys. And so if any of you would like to be a part of those, um, or to start one yourself or to join another group, um, please contact me and, um, and uh, I, can, I can set you up with, with Andrew to do that. Um, another thought that I'm having now is that when you are out and about, um, somebody, I can't remember what her name was, asked this question, but what uh, kind of what can we do? How can we get maybe work with other marine debris artists? Um, Sometimes folks take their trash home and they throw it away, but I know that if you're anywhere on the central and south coast, there's actually a drop-off point for washed ashore. Isn't that right? Yeah. Yeah, just south of Bandon. Yeah. Uh, 101, there's a yeah. place where you can drop off your marine debris. Yeah, and I know that um, uh, Haystack Rock Awareness Program did also have a drop-off point at the Cannon Beach City Hall if you... Um, had plastic you wanted to drop off there. Um, so uh, I think that that's still happening. It is an odd time right now. We're kind of in this weird uh, space-time continuum. <laughs> it's just out of space time. So um, I know that uh, the solve cleanup in spring was canceled or postponed, and it may be happening on July 5th. July 5th is a huge day on the Oregon coast to pick up trash, but also as is the winter, but the winter storms, that's when Elizabeth does a lot of her collecting. 
Um, but the summer months are really the popular months when people seem to get out there and do their cleanups. Um, but keep a lookout on, on Solve social media to see um, if any of those, if, if that July 5th cleanup is happening. And um, next week, for those of you that are still here, and it looks like we still have folks here, which is awesome, um, we are going to be talking to Megan Ponder. And Megan Ponder worked on the film, The Story of Plastic. And so she is going to be our guest next week. We're very excited about that as well. Um, we, uh, and also uh, Oregon Shores, um, Coast Watch, Cape Falcon, Marine Reserve, um, Surf Rider, we are going to be sharing the story of plastic on June 18th. So we'll be actually doing a screening and those screenings are happening all up and down the coast in, there's like a North Coast Regional, there's a Central Coast Regional screening, um, but that'll happen in uh, June. So outside of our official Marine Debris Month that I've put together because of COVID-19 here. Um, and then on uh, the 27th of May, so two weeks from tonight, we are welcoming Ryan Parker, who is a beach ranger and has been collecting and picking up trash um, specifically on the Oregon coast for a number of years. And he also would have been showing his presentation at our Sharing the Coast conference in March. So I'm looking forward to that as well. Um, I was really looking forward to that. I was looking forward to all of these. And so I'm glad that now we're doing them online. So um, thank you for coming. And please contact me at jessie at oregonshores.org. And I think you've already um, seen Elizabeth's information, but um, Elizabeth, thanks again. This was really, really great, really fun. Thank thanks you so much. Me. Okay, good night, everybody. Thanks again, bye. <laughs>